something like I, you, here, are, thing. And it's so tempting for me to say, well, I, you, here, are, thing, no. So, paso facule sofa yoke makalata. I want to make this into a suffix. If you are just joining us now on YouTube, I bid you a hearty welcome to the channel. Uh, my name is Colin Gorey. This is a channel all about language, language, linguistics, conlanging, language learning. Conlanging is the name of the game today, though, because we are about to continue our series, Conlang With Me. If this is not your, if this is your first uh, time seeing it, there's a whole playlist of previous work that we've done, so you can check that out. Um, but for now, I think we should just we should just dive in. Let's dive in. So we have this language. Woo, there we go. We have this language that we've been working on called protocol. And the backstory is that we started with a language, Eustamiakal, uh, which means roughly the, the language of the fragrant coast. We've got some world building going on here too. Uh, not a lot, but we can do some more later. And we have the ability to essentially move backwards in time, which is what we've done. And we've made a, a language that this, this conlang descended from. And we're calling this language protocol. Literally proto-language. Call just means language in Yustamia call. You can see right here. Um, which derives from the protoform quale. So, um, basically, we took a text that we made in Yustamia call Hoska Papayawi, the raven and the swan. And we applied all of our sound changes back and we got this prototext, which turns out as Hwasakwa Papayawi. Now, what happened was when you just sort of mechanically reverse all the sound changes, you end up with something that is um, very similar in many ways to the descendant language, which is not probably what we would expect. We'd expect there to have been some grammatical changes. So uh, basically what we've been doing is making those grammatical changes happen just in reverse. So we know what the descendant language looks like. We now have to make the proto language work in a slightly different way that's still plausible for the descendant language to work the way it does, if that sentence made any sense. Um, so uh, one of the things that happened, and I'm just sort of catching everyone up on the last few episodes, is that we had all sorts of really, really long words as a result of doing these, undoing these sound changes. Um, and for whatever reason, call it a quirk, I didn't love the um, idea of having roots that have four, uh, four or five and six syllables in this language. So I imposed a morpheme structure constraint. So our roots in the proto-language can be maximum three syllables. So that means anything that looks like a root and is four syllables is not a root. It's a derived form in some way. So we made some of those into, um, we made some of those into compounds. So let's see if we can come up with an example here. Um, ah, yes. So we have this form in the um, descendant language in Yustamia call, which is antuk, and it means home. And when we worked backwards from our sound changes, um, we came up with this protoform, something like anato, something like anatolqua. Um, too long. So what we did was we turned this word into a morphologically complex form, anatochqua. And this hukwa thing is a is nominalizing suffix. And anato, we turn into the verb to enclose. So this is an enclosure or a home. This is um, the act of enclosing. So enclose plus this nominalization. And we have a sound change that makes this drop out and then the two vowels in hiatus turn into a long one which is where we get anatolqua from and that's how we get antuk in the uh in yustamia okay that so that's basically the 
the route that we've been taking. We've been going through and we've been doing this with all of the words that sort of need this treatment. And along the way, we've discovered some really cool kind of morphology almost by accident, uh, just by trying to make things fit with the, dis with, uh, the Eustamia, the descendant, the descendant language forms. We've, we've come up with some cool, um, some cool structures. So let's go and look at this tab. This is the comparative lexicon tab. Um, you're not missing out on much up here in the, uh, the top right. It just says notes. Um, and so we have some areas to work on still, but I want to I want to show you some cool stuff. So we had this form masfa in Yustamia, which means sun, and we have this form masliku, which means bright. And so when we undid all the sound changes, we had these things go back to something like masafa and masel something like masaliku. Um, Notice that they have this masa in common. And so we made a morpheme masa, which a root, which means bright or white. And then we derive forms like masa fa, the bright one, with this nominalization, this nominalizing suffix fa, which is like an agent nominalizer. So the, the bright, the, the, the brightener, the brighter, I don't know, the, the bright one is a good way of translating it, I think. And then we have this masa le, which means bright. We don't know what this le uh, morphology is. I've called it a stem extender here because it's just a sort of, I have no idea what this this is. Um, but nevertheless, these words are, are morphologically, related, uh, morphologically related. And then how do we get masliku from this? We go, because that's too long for the proto-language, masa le uko, I think is what it would be. So we turn this into a compound. Instead of being bright, it is bright color. So masala bright uko color. So then this gives us in in our modern language masliku or masligu because we have intervocalic voicing, but forget about that for now. Okay, so that's the, the flavor of what we've been doing. And so I have put in yellow the things where we have not yet um, we we have some more things to do. Ah, Jamin, welcome. Welcome, welcome. First time watching live. Oh, that's so cool. I'm glad you could join us. So, yeah, I, went, I basically I stayed up late one night. I went through all of this, making sure all the you know the things proper things were bold and everything was sorted in a, a nice order. And I noticed that there were some things that that didn't satisfy me a ton. And one of them is this this Eustamia word uyu, which is our complementizer. And complementizer would be a, a thing like the English word that in I know that you are here. So it introduces a subordinate clause. And so we have this in, in Eustamia, but I thought it's a bit, I don't know, I, I just don't love it for the proto language. But what we could do is we could have the complementizer come from a word meaning thing. So the proto form for uyu would be oyo. And what if oyo originally meant thing? So if we look at um, if if we look at the development of a complementizer, I, I need to get some place to, to write so that I can just give you some examples. So um, so you are here. I know that you are here. So remember that we have an SOV language. Uh, this is what we're dealing with, a subject-object-verb language. And so in a subject-object-verb language, we'd have something more like um, you here are and you here are that I know. Or you might have I before that before this, so I, you, that, no. Um, so when we think about it this way, how might we come up with these complementizers? What is the pathway of grammaticalization? So we have a, we have some sort of grammatical morpheme that it has to come from somewhere, right? These things don't just spring up out of thin air, do they? Um, well, a lot of people think no, and we have a lot of 
historical evidence that they come from lexical words. So more sort of robust and full-bodied words about things that you talk about in, you know, in, in the world, like a thing. Or um, uh, we can think of, um, what would be a good example of this? Um, we could think of... Mm. I'm trying to think of an example that doesn't require a ton of uh, backstory. Yeah, maybe I'll leave that. I'll leave that to the side for now. Um, but uh, I re I really wish my my mind would something would spring up and I could give you the perfect example. I will if I, if one comes to me, I will I will uh, I will do that. But um, yes, Damon, correct. So this is very similar, if not identical, to the Japanese or Korean order. Um, two SOV languages par excellence. Um, so this is SVO and this is SOV. Yeah, <laughs> right. You have, uh, you have a very good source of evidence on that one. So given this, given that we want our grammatical item that to come from some word, what word could it come from? And when you think about it, you could say something like, I know, now we're going back to the English word order, I know something. Namely, you are here. I know something. That something is, you are here. Or I know that. What's that? The fact that you are here. And so maybe this comes to be a little bit of a good example of, a grammatical, of grammaticalization. Um, what if you stopped interpreting this as, I know that, in other words, you are here. And you just started saying, I know that you are here. Now you have something that's indistinguishable from a complementizer. I know that you are here. But it doesn't have to be this demonstrative like that. It could be something like a thing. And I think this is the pathway to grammaticalization that happened in Korean and Japanese, um, where you have a something like I, you, here, are, thing. No. Oop. Yeah. So then this word I you hear are thing, no. I say that as if it should make sense to you. Um, but basically what you're saying is, I know a thing, namely that you are here. And this word for thing turns into the complementizer. So that's basically the idea. So our proto word for thing turns into a complementizer in Eustamia call. That's the gist of that. Um, so then let's go back to our, oops. Oh, the phonological changes, if anyone wants to see them. Um, let's go back to our comparative lexicon. Yeah, it's, it's exactly, exactly. It's, I know, I know the fact that you are here. Um, yeah. Justin, welcome. Yes, you caught me live. Excellent. Oh, so glad to have, so glad to have so many people here live, middle of the day, at least in this part of the world it might be the middle of the night for some of you and in which case i really i doff my hat um thank you so much for joining us and uh, let's okay so let's let's take this idea and let's say that in the in Eustamia we have this as the complementizer let's just write it like that why not um this is our complementizer an L in there just to remind us. Um, and then in the proto language, this is a thing. So then we can remove this. Boom. I, you, here, are, thing, no. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. That's exactly it. So um, if we have, let's go to our text and change this. So we need... I think we have it somewhere in the proto text. We need to find this oyo. Ah, here it is. 
Oops. So basically, and he learned that he was already good. Paso facole sofa ya oyo ta makala. So in this case, we're going to We could just tr translate this as, um, and he learned a thing that he was, namely that he was already good. Um, but this already looks like it's been sort of grammaticalized to be a, um, a complementizer. So I'd rather change this construction altogether and give us some kind of other, some kind of ending on this, like, n. Nah. I don't know what that would be. Some, but we could just call that the complementizer. Paso um, facole sofa yun ta makala. Something like that. We can change what that is because actually we can't have n because this is a strict CV language. So it might be something like yun na um, or yun na something. Uh, so let's, if anyone has anything that's very, that's euphonious and just cries out to you as, hey, that's a complimentizer right there. Um, let me know and then we can get rid of that. Okay, so that's one of the things that I wanted to do. We can just call it enough for now though. And then the next thing is, uh, let's go back to our comparative lexicon. We have a word for, um, we have a word for thing in the um, in the proto in the sorry in Yustamia, which is yagam. But now we have two words for so we have two words for thing in the proto language. Now we have oyo and yakama, and I think yakama should be not the word for thing. It should it should come in in Yustamia to replace the void left by oyo becoming a complementizer. So I would like, okay, this I think is kind of cool. I would like to derive this from a, a word meaning a deed or a doing. And here's what I'm thinking. We have this verb, this light verb, y, which means to do, which we add after adjectives to make them into things that can be verbalized. We also have another piece of the puzzle here, which is that we have all sorts of words with this a, schwa alternation. So I'll show you what I mean. We have this nominalizing suffix which sometimes shows up as hkwa and sometimes as hkwa. And I want this to be some something grammatical, this alternation, this schwa a alternation. I don't know exactly what it is yet, but we're going to build it in. Because it's not the only place where we find this. If in fact yakama is from y kama then we'll find it here too. And so we have these two forms of the verb. So if this means deed or doing, then we have this comma, which could be a kind of like a, a, a verbal noun form, a, uh, like a, a gerund. Um, so that would be possible. And then I wanna show you another case where we have this uh, ah alternation which is sofa. So we have sofa, which is the word good. And then we have this kind of stew, which was one of the very first words we made, which is suftalia in Ustamia call. But this is too long for the proto language, so we have to break it up. What do we break it up into? Sofa taluya. And this sofa is, right is, is, is really close to sofa. And it's so tempting for me to say, well, the name of a stew is good something. It's like, I don't know what it is, but it's talia is something and sofa is good. So we have this alternation here again. Sofa, sofa. We will make sense of this in the distant future or maybe the not so distant future. But I just want to point out that the language seems to be by utter chance taking us in this direction. So let's make uh, let's make the most of it. And let's say that yagam in Yustamia call is yakama in protocol, which means a deed. So then this is going to be from 
from you yeah we don't know exactly how this is going to go but we have this alternation to do and then plus comma which is I'll call it a verbal noun we have all sorts of nominalizing suffixes at the moment we don't have a lot of order to them but We'll get there. Maybe we don't have to have a huge amount of order. Um, so yakama becomes yagam, which means thing. And so we have this nice semantic shift where oyo means thing in the proto language, turns into a complementizer, and then the word for deed gets semantically bleached and turns into the word for thing. So yeah, cool. Okay, I am now going to catch up on some of the things that you have written. We have who as a potential um, as a potential uh, complementizer, and we have eke. So I think we should use both. Um, so let's do that, and let's go back to our proto text, and let's say let's use both. Let's say who is. Let's say who can be used for actions and ek can be used for states or something like that. That could be kind of a fun yo eke, which would probably be something like ye eke. Um, and so that is, let's just, okay, this is the stative complementizer. And then who would be the, the active complementizer. So let's add entries for these things. Eke. So because um, because the sentence in the text is uh, a state to be good um, or already to be good, paso facule sofa yoeke to makala. Oh, that's a good question. Is that meant to be? Um, is that meant to be a schwa? Okay. LVP. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. All right, all right, 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 right. So I'm going to, let's assume that this is a schwa. So it's not AK, it's OK. And go back over here. OK. And we don't yet have a future tense. That's the one thing. I've been, I've been using a a kind of um, a verb to want uh, for for things like um, conditionals. Uh, maybe we could use that for the future tense, or maybe we could just use the pre have a past non past system. Um, Okay, these are some good ideas. There's one more thing that I want to do that's kind of grammatical in nature. So let's, we don't have to worry about this for now. Um, so we have this ya ya. Let's add that here and then we can remove this. Good past colon giving all these notes. Um, what else do we need? Oyo. Sofa has this. Ah, ah, okay. Okay. One thing I wanted to do is make this a little more kind of, I have this idea in my mind of the, the sort of the classic SOV language. And it's roughly Korean or Japanese. Um, and, you know, I'm not sure how theoretically sound that idea of a classic SOV language is um, being, or at least having those as my, my, go-to examples but nevertheless there we are and so 
one thing I've noticed is that we have a, this past tense marker, which is t. And it's the past tense on polysyllabic verbs. And I, I want to make this into a suffix. I just want to make this into a suffix. Or, I don't know. I just think it's, it's, it's got to be a suffix. So that's what we'll do. We'll make it into a suffix. And I think we'll remove this distinction between polysyllabic and monosyllabic verbs in the proto-language. So then let's do that. So this is our past marker. And let's say it's now a suffix. And so let's go back to our texts. And now we have tamakala. That's now going to be makalata. So paso facule sofa yo ke makalata. Um, and then that's going to have to be propagated all the way around here. Da, 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 da. We have a variety of these, so I will probably not bore you with the entire process just as we go. But even so, I'm really getting excited about sentences like Okapina to Kelaya pa Satana Sigma Homesu to Anato Hakwa Umasata. I don't know. I just, this is, to me, it, it's just a feeling. I don't know what it is, but it just, it clicks. Um, Okapina ta kalaya pa satanesima homasu ta anatohakwa umasata. I like it. It feels like feels like a language. Um, oh goodness gracious! Look at all of this stuff. So long schwa can lower to uh, to ah uh, perhaps yeah perhaps yeah I, I have taken out of the this form of the language. I've taken vowel length out, but what I'm thinking is maybe. Or maybe what we could do is we could have an earlier form of the language. So we could do some internal reconstruction where there was like a, maybe a pitch accent thing going on and, uh, you know, something like that. And unaccented things became schwa and accented things became ah. Uh, uh, that's possible. Um, okay. And then, yes, good point that will urgently and to a certain extent still does mean want um, and then Damien saying ya wants becoming the uh, future tense marker in somewhere along the line between the proto language and the descendant language yeah I like that idea where did ya wants is that coming from somewhere or is that um, is that a new invention um, do I have that no. Okay. Well, let's let's write it in. Let's just put it here. Call this future. And we'll do that. And okay. So good. I think. I don't know. I think I might. I think I might break it here for YouTube. Just I've noticed that you know my videos are getting kind of long on YouTube. So I'm gonna break it here for YouTube. Um, I'm gonna do a quick, um, quick segment outro. Uh, so thank you for those of us on YouTube joining us. We have had a good time today. We've tried to. We've tried. We, we've done some linguistic archaeology, um, and we've been messing around in the proto language. So if you like this kind of thing. Stay tuned because there's plenty more to come. Um, the usual stuff, like, subscribe, ding dong, click the bell, all that good jazz. Um, and we'll see you next time.